Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College and Yeshiva University here in New York City. The 1960s and 70s were periods of widespread rebellion, dissent, protest, discontent, and militancy against the established order in the United States and around the world. Many of those concerns still exist and have manifested themselves with greater ferocity today, destructiveness demanding change with even greater urgency than was the case six decades ago. Our guest and co-host today on The Radical Imagination was in the forefront of much of the political and cultural turmoil of that period. Few match the diversity of his life experience, background, struggles, and triumphs. Felipe Luciano was born in New York City, raised in East Harlem and Brooklyn, by a devout Pentecostal single mother and instilled with cultural pride in his Afro-Puerto Rican ancestry by his late grandmother. At age 12, he became part of the Canarsie Chaplain Division Gang and by 16 was sent to prison where he served two years for attempted manslaughter. He attended Queens College when he was released and joined the last poets known for their powerful spoken word performances and streetwise verse. They were the forerunners to a later rap and hip hop era. In the late 1960s, he became the co-founder and chairman of the civil and human rights organization, the Young Lords Party, the Puerto Rican counterpart to the Black Panther Party. He founded and produced several acclaimed radio shows from the 1970s to the present that featured Latin-centric cultural political discussions and Afro-Cuban music. In the mid-1970s, he joined NBC TV as a general reporter and later as a weekend anchor, becoming the first Puerto Rican news anchor of a major media network station in the country and winning an Academy Award for best reporting for his story about New York City's notorious jail complex on Rikers Island. Felipe recently earned a master's degree in Christianity and social justice from New York City's Union Theological Seminary. He can be heard on radio station WBAI on his Latin Roots program Saturdays from two to four and on his What's Going On program Thursdays from seven to eight a.m. And you'll hear him on this program as well. I'm blessed and honored to welcome him as a regular, occasional co-host on The Radical Imagination. Stephen Sondheim might have had Felipe in mind in a song from his 1971 musical, Follies. Good times and bum times. <laughs> I've seen them all. I got through all of last year and I'm here. Lord knows, at least I was there, and I'm here. Look who's here. I'm still here. Welcome, Felipe. What a glowing, what a Glo glowing tribute. But the most important part is we're still here. We're still here. You're here, I'm here, we're That's here. Right. And we're here at the beautiful Eminem Studios. Sam Mendez, director. Oh, Miss Mendez is a gem. And, she's, and she's, our producer. She's a genius. Absolutely. And our producers are too. Uh, Freddie, uh, Carla, yes. Tiffany. I love them all. I we mean, do. this is the. Remember, this was a police was a firehouse before. Well, it's and still to see it transformed in yeah. the way it's been transformed is just wonderful. Just Absolutely. Wonderful. Absolutely. Um, a few things, and, and just a few blocks from a lot of the the stuff that happened. That's right. From Which the People's Church and everything else. This is at about here. 104th Street was always a hub. Right. It was always a good hub. Um, just a few things. Sure. Uh, I never won an Academy. I won two Emmy Awards. I wish, I, I wish I had an Academy where I, I could charge more money. Wait a minute. Did I say Emmy? No, you said, you said Academy. So. Well, you should have. Anyway, <laughs> and also, it wasn't the Canarsie Chaplain. I said winning an Emmy Award. All oh, right. Uh, you said Academy. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, the <laughs> Canarsie Chaplains, I admired and I hung out with them. And when I got arrested, I got arrested with them. Okay. But I was part of a group in Brownsville called the Frenchmen. 
So just to, to make that okay, clear. Okay, sure. That's all. We'll that's all. Defense. Everything all right. else was well, we've got glowing and beautiful. We've got to get the facts correct. Yes, here. absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. So we wanted to spend some time, that's the title of this, the theme of this show today. The transformative future. We've been there, we are, we're now here. What holds for our, our future, for the country, for the world? You've been involved, and I too, also to an extent, in the struggles for the last 50, 60 years. What has changed? What has changed as you look around, particularly in this neck of the woods with your own people and in the country and world generally? What has changed from we have your early days struggling as a, as a young lord? We have, in America, a nihilism, a partisanship from an ideological point of view, um, and a willingness to listen to nonsense and to drivel and to um, lies yeah. that has, because we don't read, we're not an educated people. Americans still are not an educated people. We have great intellectuals. We have great minds in this country. Is but that because we haven't had the sort of government policy? No, it's because we haven't developed a, a solid uh, public education policy. That's what I was saying. That's what I was trying to get across. So yeah. if you don't know policy, if you don't have uh, a, a solid public education, when you've never read uh, the, um, the Bill of Rights, when you've never studied the Constitution, when you've never studied the Bill of Rights, when you haven't read the Federalist Papers, when you haven't done that in high school mm -hmm. and in college, and surgically dissected what our country is about, even with white men who were slaves and, and, and had huge amounts of land, you're doing yourself a disservice. When should that education begin? In kindergarten. In, yeah, in various forms. In right, kindergarten, exactly. you begin to talk about what democracy is. We are on the verge, on the threshold, of losing this experiment called democracy. Yeah. Yeah. This is no joke. No. Um, we've seen it happen. It happened in Brazil. You remember when they took over, the military took over? Mm -hmm. It happened in Chile. It happened, and it happened in Germany. Yeah. They thought that the revolution was going to happen in other places, and instead it happened in Germany. Uh, they, they rebelled. Um, we should add, in Germany's defense, that we destroyed them. The Allies, destroyed Italy, France, England, and the United States destroyed them in World War I. Right. And, the and they took all their coal, Versailles all their gold, trees, all their timber, right, right. all of their natural resources. Right. They were left bereft. They were left with nothing. Out um, of vengeance. Out of vengeance. Well, fr and France was particularly uh, uh, vengeful. But we, we hurt yeah. them. You cannot hurt a people like that Absolutely. and think that they're not going to come back. Or an individual. Or an individual, for that matter. Yeah. So um, a little-known corporal decides that he's going to uh, make Germany great again. Now look at the similarities between him and this gentleman who we call Trump. I'm going to make you great again. You have nothing. You're down and out. Um, there are people who are trying to take you over. There are people who are lying to you. So what, he's this, what he did, which is what Hitler did, and Goebbels said this, if you lie enough to the people, yeah. enough times, enough times, they come to believe it. They become to believe it. What he first did is destroyed the belief in the press. He wanted to destroy the legitimacy of the press. Mm -hmm. Got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Then he destroyed the, legitima the legitimacy of the political process. I won. He, this guy didn't. He destroyed the power of the judiciary. I mean, he took it apart. He just ripped the whole court system. He has more right-wing judges. Um, yeah. uh, and listen, I have no Academics, problem with right-wing. Academics, intellectuals. Everybody. And, so on, yeah. and by the way, many of my friends are right-wing. That uh, doesn't mean I hate them. We discuss things. Um, can you? Can you? Oh, yes. Are they willing? Listen, so they're not... So you being, are being, being a communicating with people who are, who are different right than I am. But still But open there's, there's a civility. Enough. There's civility there. Is that because, why is that? Because of you? Well, because I refuse Friendship? to get caught up in their diatribes. I refuse to get caught up in their catch whistles. Um, I refuse to do it. We talk, and I love them. And I believe what the Bible says, love is forgiving, love is, love is all tolerant. 
You've got to be able to love the person first of all. So okay. I do not you get caught up in that. I have uh, very close family members who are Trumpites. I don't care. And they know it. They know you they love know, them. They know I love them. But tell us a little, what, what is the conversation about? How do you do it in a loving way? You don't just don't sit there, right? Or you, you I, don't just I, uh, I, I ask them, not do, do you talk really, about do it. Do you really believe that putting a child in solitary confinement for 20 years is the way to... Um, to rehabilitate them, I think it's barbarous. What do I they think, say? In, yes, they I don't do. Want, they I don't, say it. I don't want. Understand mm. when you put people up against the wall, they have another thing to say. They'll they'll go back to their original premise, which is kill them all, get rid of them, use the electric chair, use gas, use whatever you can, because they're afraid. Wait a minute. Are, is this conversation with your family that you're having? Sometimes family. Sometimes. Members. Also, if you you address that question to them. What I a particular tell member. What whatever. I tell them, and, and, what, and they, they're a little they innuendo. Um, in, in Yiddish, they call it a stoop. They'll give me little stoops, you know, like, you know, what will you do if your daughter? What will you do? I don't listen to that. Right. You cut to the chase. I cut to the chase. Number one, do you believe right. that public education is a right? Do you believe that we should revise the, uh, the public education? Do you think that the government should be in charge of that? I think that public education or, uh, and, pub and college should be funded by the government. Do you believe that because someone has a million dollars that they should get a better education than your son? That's well, I, I don't stop there. Can, can we just go for a second to that question of, like you would put forward? Put forward. Um, do you believe someone, a kid, whoever it may be, be put in solitary confinement for 20 years? And do you, what is the justification? For so let's say you're around the, the kitchen table here. You address that question to them. What would they say if he's, what a, if he's a menace to society that's if he's a menace to they don't care about him, him being a menace to himself if he's a menace to society we should lock him up now so remember, he deserves it that's he what deserves it oh, that's that moralistic stuff Moralist. we did that in uh, uh, the turn of the century England right 1900s and the 18th we put people in manacles it's like saying if you perceive of a woman as a witch you should burn her at the stake We've mm -hmm. already done this in America. We are notorious for this. Um, it would, would, if your dear mother was still alive, would, what would she? She voted for Giuliani. Okay. All and right. she said, you know something? And here's where we have so to, leftists have to understand what crime means to people. She said, Felipe, I can walk the streets now. He got rid of all of those kids on the corners. He got rid of all of them. Uh, he picked them up. She didn't care about the consequences of those actions on Rikers Island or in various county jails. She only cared that she could walk the streets. Understand where they're coming from. Puerto Ricans in particular are very law and order. I don't know why we think Puerto Ricans are so revolutionary. They're not. They really believe in family, the Bible, and the United States of America. They love Puerto Rico, but they don't want it independent. So uh, at least most of them don't. Mm. I understand my mother. And as leftists, I consider myself a Christian socialist. We have to really understand what the common bread and butter issues are of the people walking the streets. Yeah. I, as I wa remember, I used to fight police all the time. I go to, I was, the other day I was walking down the street and I saw two cops, big right. Latino guys. And I said, thank you for being here. Imagine that, 50 years later, I'm saying thank you. Mm. They fell, in, in British they say fell. They, they, mm. they, they were beaming with pride. But don't you point out, or can't you point out, that so much of the budget is directed at militarism and the militarization of the police and, and the prison industrial complex. And, and rather than the sort of economic issues, right, that would really make a difference in the world. So crime, the use of crime by demagogues by, like Giuliani uh, and his police commissioners, right, Bratton and so on, Kelly, uh, is really to get people to think riled up. It, it, to get them riled up. I love Kelly, by the way. Uh, yeah, I, I why? Like him. He, well, he was a cop here in East Harlem. So? He used to chase me around all the time. Yeah. Um, and he used to tell me, you have, what did he say? He used to say, you have an anger management problem. Um, okay. But I loved him. I went to see him at Police Plaza. I don't have a problem well, with police. What I have a problem with. Well, let me tell you also that it was under his administration 
as you know, uh, but he was we, under. We were, we were, uh, uh, we protested stop and frisk. Yes. The first trial back. It, it was like apartheid. It was. It and that was thing. Bratton's creation also. Yes, it was. So, and now I have to tell you, I met uh, both of them actually. <laughs> who did you they're, like? Who they're did out you, in the Hamptons. Who did you like more? Living out, uh, and, and Julia. Who did you like more? Who did I like? Well, actually, Lynch was more down home and stuff. Bratton was. Lynch? Lynch. Yeah. I or Kelly, I'm sorry, Kelly. Kelly, Kelly Kelly's, Kelly's my guy. Um, okay. Yeah, but what does that have to do with the has policy? Nothing to do with the, be, with, okay, has nothing to do with policy. All right, I don't mean to distract It's like, it's like Giuliani. He's an engaging guy. His policies are horrible, and I told him that. Right. Well, I'm sure Hitler at some level was very engaging, yes, too. Yes, that's right. So now, we have to look beyond that. because How, do we, how do we, yeah. as progressives, Jim, right. uh, the message. As, how do we explain to people the nuance and subtlety of crime. How do we explain Great to them that question. the kid is yeah. um, unstable, the kid has tremendous emotional problems, and needs, <sighs> yes, needs to be put away, needs to be, but how do we take that money and put it into therapy? But wait a minute, why do you jump to saying they need to be put away? What about the educational programs? The well, I started, went to New York City Public yeah. Schools, and I, you know, way back when, and got a, an unbelievable education. I knew how to read and write. Yes, and I did too. I had, I had, I have the right. best Western classical education. And that makes all the difference in the world. Well, it gives you, it gives you an ability to understand um, the past. For example, I say if you don't read the past, you're doomed to repeat it, which is what we're going through now. And uh, and I don't want to get past the question that you have, which okay. is, sure, um, how do you get people to understand the solitary confinement? that staying on a penal island like Rikers Island um, is the wrong thing to do. I'm telling you, when they busted me, I was 16 years of age. Um, we were in a gang fight, and one of my guys killed, stabbed the guy. I was right there, stabbed. I didn't even know he was dead. Stabbed the guy. Right, right. For me, for me, jail was the best thing that could have happened to me. Getting away from my community, wait a minute, getting mm. away from my community, getting away from uh, everything caused me to Focus on self and spirituality. Were I had you to able to do that? Yes, I was. Prison at that time. Yes, how, I was. How so? Well, in those days, and here's the politics of generational change. In those days, if you were fairly bright, people in the project would say, you know, he's, he, he, he can spell. And they would have me pr pronounce things hmm. like uh, uh, antediluvian or primordial. They wanted, they would fascinated by the fact that I took the English language and I made it palatable to them. Explain what this word means, man. Explain what this means. Right. So I would, they enjoy. And you did that in prison too? Is that what you I did that in prison too. Um, can I add this one little changed. dimension? Can yeah. I add one dimension before sure. we go on this? Look, my, my colleagues, uh, psychiatrist James Gilligan and yeah. Bandy Lee, who we've given symposiums uh, at, at Union Theological and I hope to open an institute for the prevention of violence. He's worked in the California prison system with Tom Hayden. Uh, in what does he say about it? The key is to lose the word punishment. Yes. You need to restrain pe some people, repeating violent people, and within that restraining uh, a therapeutic environment, give them the sort of counseling, education, I nurturing agree. that they never got. We spend 100000 or more exactly. per teenager in this state. But that why can't becomes we use them that, the right coddling why criminals. Why can't we, How would that, why I'm sorry. Can't we use that to, How? to offer therapy? Why not? Education, one-on-one -on -one education. This Sometimes collectively it doesn't work. You have to grab that kid by himself and, and deal with him. I understand, but still within a non-punitive environment. So again, I'll be quiet well, for where, a where is the place? Where is the place in Europe? Norway, Finland, Sweden? Yeah, the where Nordic have, model. Where they have of course. incredible uh, rates. They don't have incredible the rates of recidivism. Rates down. And you can walk in and out. Uh, and they tell you, you got to stay here for a while. And that's what another thing you could tell your family members or your right-wing friends, that 70% are going to come out and commit crimes again. So they're not safer. They, at all. So, uh, uh, again... They don't understand. I think it's important that we have young men and women um, know who they are. There's so much fear in our community. There's so much dysfunction. So many kids have been abused. So many kids have been physically abused, sexually abused, mentally abused. 
that they don't see themselves as confident. Sometimes I walk right. through East Harlem and Harlem, and I look at the kids, and they're like yeah, tough yeah. guys. And I said, what's happening, man? They never expect the guy with a tie to say, what's happening? Yo, right. yo, what's up? And when it gets to the point where I feel comfortable, I go, man, why, 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 are you, why do you have such a dour expression? What do you mean dour? I mean, you have an expression yeah, no. that says, yeah. I hate everybody. You're a good looking guy, man. What's the deal? What are you afraid of? And I talk to them, talk with right, them. Right, right, right. I don't talk at them. Um, and I build friendships that way, even on my block. What people are afraid of young kids now. It's almost, and of course, the, the, the uh, televangelist, not only all the televangelists, but some of the right wing nationalists will say, the Bible says that one day son shall go against father and father. The truth is, is that these are still children. I'll give you a little story. I was in the Brooklyn House of Detention uh, for about four months. And I used to sing songs to the guys mm -hmm. to, go to make them go to sleep. Right. Um, I have a friend, uh, Bill McLeod, who is now one of the great uh, Aikido teachers, who said, I remember you singing Moon River. Mm. I remember you singing songs from Snow White. Andy Williams. Andy Williams, Moon River, I would do that. Oh yeah. Do you know that they would <laughs> snore? They would, these are banal songs, but it doesn't matter. They needed to hear a voice that reminded Something them of Something nurturing and yes. caring. And when I didn't sing right. it, when I didn't sing them to sleep, um, Diablo, who was the head of the tier, right. would say, Philip, Philip, that was my name before, right, right, my right. original name. Philip, sing the songs. I said, Papa, I'm tired, man. I don't right. want to sing. I'm, he said, he said, sing the song. And he said well, it in such an authority He yeah, said yeah. such an authority of time, uh, so, such an authoritative voice that I would start singing. And the people, the tier would laugh. Right. They would laugh so loud. They said, he's, he's stupid, but he ain't crazy. Because mm. who would ever want to fight Diablo? I had one running with him. I never wanted it again. Right. The point is, is that these are children. We don't give them a sense of the wonderment of youth. I believe that hugging is great. I believe that talking, I talk to them about simple things. I believe that our public education is the, the beginning of democracy is a solid public education. Mm -hmm. And what Dostoevsky said is very true. The mark of a civilization can be judged by entering the gates of its prisons. We are way off. We are way off. But what you're also referring to, sociologists call it structural violence. These are the, the violence that accrues to people, working class and poor people, yes. as a result of their everyday exploitation and so on. But you're breaking it down at that individual level. Absolutely, the nurturing that they're not getting. I mean, as you were talking, I mean, it's like, a mother putting their babies exactly. to bed, and they're not, they haven't gotten there. That's what Gilligan is also talking about, is needed with the more, you know, w w with the adults that he dealt with. Listen, I deal with white middle class kids a lot. Uh, I <coughs> white what? White middle class middle kids. Middle class, okay. I hug them the same way I hug a brother. Right. Don't you understand that having money is not it? Right. What they want is not an absentee mother. What they want is not a work ethic father that they don't see. They want love. They want somebody to see them as human beings and who love them regardless of their limitations. Um, and that's important. My kids have to remind me all the time, listen, you may be all revolutionary outside, but here you're daddy. Mm -hmm. So don't forget that. My kids are not, they're progressive, but they're not revolutionary. Now right. they tell me, dad, stop trying to push us into that stuff. Mm -hmm. We understand that you are into armed struggle if it's gonna come, um, that you are into violence. We're not there. We don't you believe. You are, are you? Well, I believe in self-defense, yes. Okay. That's, and I think we're on the verge. That's different, no, well, in a sense. Not pe people don't see it that way. Well, it the there's a distinction between defensive uh, no, no, violence and your defending self -defense. I believe right. that any species that does not protect itself is doomed to failure, is doomed to die. And I don't know any species on this planet that would not fight back. I was chasing a rat the other day in East Harlem, yeah. and he backed into a corner and he looked at me like, I wish you would try. You know, I left him alone. Um, I'm, you could see him desperate. Uh, and I got next to him, almost like from between you and me. Yeah. I said, go, go, go. And he just stood there. I said, you know something? Mm. You win. You win. I'm going to mm -hmm. go away. Yeah. Now, uh, I would have won it. I would have questioned him, but that's not the point. I, would, I might have gotten bitten. I might, it's a pyrrhic victory. It's not worth it. Now, what So I'm you're talking about the, the entire culture. No, but I want you to, I want right, you to understand ahead. something. All right, go ahead. Richard Nixon said, if I were a black person in America, I'd be a black panther. Mm. He said that. Mm -hmm. I think that we still do not understand um, the power of power. We don't understand it. If people come at you a certain way, 
Jim, you and I walking down the street, and uh, you and Beatty, your wife, your beautiful wife, yep. and somebody attacks you, do you think I'm going to care about that you're white and I'm black? My job is to it protect you. My right. job is to take care of business. Your job is to help me fight, and Beatty too. But the point that I'm trying to make is that yep. we make a big thing out of this self-defense. The self-defense says, if you come at me to hurt me and my family, I'm going to do everything I can to stop you. If that means killing you, so be it. So that goes back again to your, to your family and your right-wing friends. That's what they're at that level as well. I they're am, desperate. We're all, we're all, they're but desperate. But there's, they're such, desperate. there's such an ignorance. This and they're look looking for someone with the easy answer, make them great again, to put, away, put them away, and that's yeah. that. Um, you know something? What? Um, Tell me. When you have lost all faith in institutions, right. when democracy is meaningless to you, you don't have faith in the judiciary, the educational system, the political system, um, or even in God. You know what you do? Go to one man. Mm -hmm. One person who can solve it all. And that's what this guy has been saying. I can solve it for you. I can right. go to Kim Jong-un. Un, I can go to uh, Putin. I love this these guys. We work it out. That's what he's saying, and that's what he wants. He's a dictator, and he's following Hitler's program. And we better be careful, because if Jews think, if American yeah. Jewry thinks that it's going to get away... No, They'd be the first ones in the boxcars along know. with us. Stop. And just because his, his uh, son-in-law is Jewish, I always knock my... It, not, yeah, it knocks me they, out. Look, right, when we were growing up, there were a lot of Italian cops, God, God bless them, who were married to Puerto Rican women. Right. But they hated Puerto Ricans. Do you know you could be individually very kind toward a person of color, but hate the race? I understand. I see I understand. this all the time. I understand. There are people in the South, I, I love you. I think you're a great colored guy. Yeah, but I yeah. can't stand the people who, you know, they run yeah, that so, stuff so on you. you. That's a very important point. So when you are dealing with people one-to-one, -one, that's the time that you can maybe make some inroads. Well, in the North, them. in the North, they I love, just, I just in, want the, in the North, they, okay, love, yeah, right. they love the culture, they love the collective, but they hate the individuals. Right. In the South, they yeah. hate, you could, they, they hate, they, 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 uh, don't they, get too uppity, but no, you no. In the South, live close. they love the individuals, but hate the culture. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like very different. Um, I just a believe that, we, that they're not really, really. We don't have an, aware we don't of, have yeah. a united, uh, a united matrix for education. No, we all are d thinking different things. In the South, the Civil War is called the war between the states. It's not. It's not uh, the Civil War. It's the war between the states. It's a lost cause. It's a lost cause. And, and they, they're still proud of that. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I was, I was Go ahead. fumbling around to get some, uh, just some references here. I, I, just as you were speaking, this is in today's uh, Wednesday's New York Times yeah. opinion page. What do Biden and Trump have in common? Weakness. Well, let me Weakness. tell you something. Let me and, and one last thing before we, because yeah, yeah, sure. I want you to bring some of your books in on this. This is a quote from... Uh, uh, Chomsky, masters of the universe are the principal architects of government policy and act to ensure their own interests no matter how grievous the effects are on the general welfare. So we're also dealing with that selfishness, that greed, that, that power that has no understanding or no real concern as much as we may want them to. And, and, and what I want to do is ask you, how much does moral suasion work in interaction with these sorts of people? How much would it work with a Hitler? How much does it work, or can it work? And, and well, Bonhoeffer we, thought... John Cons yes, let's Bonhoeffer bring him in on it. And, um, we need this moral message. Yeah, Bonhoeffer thought that love, education, and service would help in the Hitlerian Germany in the, after the Weimar Republic. And he says it in his letters. He says, that, you know, I think Hitler, sh you know, I love her. I don't want anything. I want to love him into cooling out. Once he saw yeah. that the church had gone right wing. Right. Once he saw that the institutions that normally um, uh, manifest the love but and that's goodness. Not nothing, that's nothing new. He right? had, no, it's not. He had to leave. Where does he go? He comes to Harlem. Goes to Abyssinian Baptist Church and sees black people worshiping God in and a way union. that's fervent union. and union. Well, he was a union graduate. Yes. Worshiping God in a way that's fervent and passionate, even though they're being crucified. Right. Castrated, beaten. 
Radical love. Radical love. So now what prophetic he does? Prophetic. This is this is the prophetic black prophetic by by uh, Cornel, Cornel West, West. Right. Uh, with the edit with the writer Christa, uh, Christa Buschendorf. Um, so what does he do? He goes back to Germany, though people warn him not to go back, and he joins the underground. He joins the underground movement. Now he knows Hitler has to go. Right. While he said we have to love people into calmness, he realized this guy has to be taken out. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. There so comes a point comes a where point at which you have to kill the guy. Now, what happens, several of... Uh, and he becomes a martyr. Well, I think if um, Rommel and his crew had been able to knock this guy out, we wouldn't have had the consequences. Yeah, but that's we had what ifs. No, but un uh, understand yeah. what happened. Well. They fooled around. The United States fooled around in its whole isolationist movement. They uh, had Nazis at the White House. We had Bund meetings here in New York. Um, the anti-Semitism was unreal. Um, we allowed Mussolini to come to power. We allowed Franco to come to power. And finally, this guy. Um, thank God that he didn't make up, uh, that the bond between uh, Hitler and Germany did not take place, because we would have had a very different world today. Um, once he realizes, once Stalin realizes that this guy is not going to join him, Stalin had to make a pact with the devil. He just wanted to beat the Allies. Uh, he wanted an industrial power. He wanted to get big. And he figured, I'll do it with this guy. Understand, I thank God, it must have been miraculous. He never attacked Britain because he was knocking them with the V2 rockets. He was not. Yeah. In other yeah. words, what Hitler was doing was propagandizing a new kind of species of man, which is what uh, this guy's doing, Trump. Um, the Aryan stereotype, the Aryan right. archetype. Right. We don't understand how close to fascism we are if we're not already there. And as if you saw um, Ralph Nader on uh, Democracy yeah. Now last night. Really? Throws support to Democrats ahead of midterm, but warns the party's message is failing. Now it's failing because they're not messaging. They're not they're strong not, they're enough. They're not they're strong not enough the in their messaging. In they're the concerned so much exactly. with Ukraine that they've forgotten that there's a guy in Boise, Idaho, right. who's trying to keep his farm going. No, that's exactly what he's saying. And you've got to speak to them. You've got to speak to them. You can't ignore, you can't ignore white people. You talking, can't yeah. make the, the party um, uh, only centered on blacks and women and abortion. You can't do it. That's what this Nader is America. Said. This is the United States of America. And you cannot become a single issue. Per they, Democrats thought that with Roe versus Wade, the overturning of that, um, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the abrogation of that, right. that, that, that they would get people on their side. You can't. Right. There no, are guys who are suffering. Right. Yeah, yeah. There are farmers who are wondering, why is my farm going down? I have to pay. There, I spoke to a guy in, um, where was I? In uh, Idaho. Iowa, 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 I'm sorry. Oh. And I'm sitting, I'm sitting at the bar, and he comes with his hat, you know, flannel shirt and stuff. Right. And I say, how are you? He says, good. <laughs> looks away. Yeah. I said, what do you do? I persisted. Yeah, so he yeah. looks at me like, what does this guy want? Yeah, yeah. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a farmer. Yeah. What do you farm? He said, eh, wheat, you know, tobacco sometimes. We got into that. So he turns to me, he says, why are you interested? I said, because mm. I like farming. Right. I think it's the backbone of America. It's too bad that we went away from those values, earth values. He said, are you a Republican? I said, no, I'm so a socialist. He said, you're so and you believe in that? I said, yeah. I believe yeah. that I want to know what your yield per crop, what, what your crop yield is. What, how right, much, right. How how much yield per acre? How, what right. are you doing? Do you are you using pesticides? What do you? Right, I right, want right. to know that my food is going to be decent when I eat it. Just like you were talking to the, the kids on uh, 104th Street yes, here. Same way. Same stuff. Same thing. And uh, that's what absolutely is needed. So he told me, I said, are you yeah. mechanized? He said, well, you got to be mechanized. He said, my problem is market prices. Because so many um, uh, major companies that's, are coming in. That's agribusiness. Buying up land, ag he says, and we can't beat them. And by that's the way, right. why do you think Mexican immigrants are here? Monsanto has bought up hundreds of thousands of acres of Mexico. Hundreds of thousands of acres. Yeah. So that the guy who has a 10 acres... 50 acres, cannot bring his corn to market and get a decent price See, for it. So that's Chomsky. So what does the prophetic fire here's what, here's of what, Cornell say? Here's what, here's what, what Cornell, do we have here's what Cornell say says. Yeah, about that. Um, uh, Radical love. Find out what any people will... This is what um, King said. No, uh, Frederick Douglass. Find out what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them and these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. Mm. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what, this was, 
for 150 years ago. Um, yeah. Martin King said, and remember Martin, if there was anyone who was a prophet, it was Martin King. And I didn't like him. I didn't like his philosophy. I didn't like his ideology uh, about uh, turning the other cheek. I really didn't. It was later that he became. But you didn't. He became. You didn't really understand it at that point. I right? understand. I was there raised was a in the church. I understand. I understand. And a power. There, well, there's a militancy. Too nonviolent. Right. There's, there's a militancy a to Buddhism too. Don't Civil think it's just. Uh, well, it's a different ball game though. Right. Between that. Uh, okay, he said. I, he said. By the way, Martin okay. became uh, a radical socialist at the end. I, I think it was always that way. I well, mean, that he, when he was. They said he was a communist in, or a socialist in. Uh, they call at him the communist. very beginning. Yeah, he well, he had communist, communist and, uh, and Malcolm has assistance. become was becoming a uh, a Sunni Muslim uh, radical. Had hmm. he been allowed to live, you know, he was going to build a mosque in Harlem, right? And he wanted to reach the people of the world. He wasn't caught up in white, black. he wanted to reach is he wanted Islam. Uh, he wanted to teach Islam that there are other people in the world. But he also wanted to build a mosque in the world to reach out to those who understood what militancy was. He was an incredible man, Malcolm. I see where you go. So you're talking about more the, the, the transformation that's needed, certainly equally to the political economic transformation, is this artistic and moral transformation. Well, I is think that, that uh, yeah, about? I think that when America that you've been starts so involved to, with. Yeah, I think when America decides to, uh, we will know that the time has come to revolt. I hope we get it before it when they start arresting artists, when they start arresting rap guys, when they start arresting people whose lyrics they can't take, we will know it's over for America. We, in South America, the first thing they do is arrest the artist. That's the first thing they do. The political parties, they just kill them, but the arrests and the torture and the incarceration. Or um, maybe the, the comedians as well. If they, the can. Set, if they can. Well, look what happened to Ukraine. That guy's a comedian. Yeah. But his heart bleeds for Ukraine. His yeah. heart uh, lives for Ukraine. I admire him mm -hmm. very much. What I do think uh, is that we have to be very careful how we balance our, out, our, our outlays to Ukraine and our outlays. Here. Billions of dollars right. have gone to Ukraine. I understand it. Right. They've held them back for a minute. Uh, this madman Putin, uh, who, well, who is, I think, Would you unstable. agree with Chomsky on this, on, uh, th that there should be defensive armaments, but the key is going to have to be negotiating and settlement? I, I always believe in negotiation. Okay. Now the problem but is, that is he, not his let back them have is everything. His back is they against. Want. He wants imperial Russia. What he wants is the Russia of, of, of old, the Tsarist right. Russia. He wants Russia that was once the the socialist. What do they call it? United Socialist Soviet Republic. He right. wants that. It's so many people want to go back to that. But nobody is going to win in a war and through violence and through punishment. Somebody and will retribution. win. retribution. Somebody will win. No, it'll we'll never. The it'll only way. The, I think one of the ways to do it is to negotiate the NATO um, contract all over again. He's afraid, we have him surrounded. Understand where he's coming from. We have him surrounded. Poland, Romania, we have same all thing of the- the Cold War. That's, that's right. Got, now what, started. well, right. in the same 62 60 missile years crisis, yeah. we got our, we got our, our, our uh, uh, into ICBMs out of Turkey. Mm -hmm. We said, okay, so we won't do that. So Russia said, fine, then we'll, give, uh, then we'll get out of your country. We'll get out of um, Cuba. If we say to them, to Putin, we will take our missile bases out of certain countries, not all of them, but certain countries, so you don't think they were encroaching upon you. Let me throw out something a little. <laughs> a Marshall Plan for the area? We for what area? Eastern Europe, Russia even. Um, we did that in Russia Western Europe, never, in never, Japan to yeah. a certain extent. Because we beat them. Okay, we, we but emulsified them. But as by the way, we had the bomb before before the end of the war. We I could understand. have done it to Germany, but these are white people. We didn't want to. We didn't want to nuclearize the, I the air. But w with with uh, you know a Marshall Plan, the nurturing of a people who have been so tor tormented and traumatized. Not this is not justifying anything he's Russians doing in their pride. And if it would accept a Marshall Plan from us. Now, I'll tell you a little secret. I make Gorbachev. I think the people would. Hold on. I think I people would want that yes. through their government. We, it would happen in, 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 the, in Western Europe. Why not? I worked for. It would happen here. That's the great society. That's yes. the New Deal. I and that's what we still. Uh, I'm sorry. It's, no, it's funny you we, say that because. Biden, I, that's what Nader was saying. Look, if, if Biden would have the courage and the guts and the strength to talk about some of the very good things he's been doing, that he's done, this, he will make inroads into that yes, he would. farmer that you've Well, first of all, Biden is a Delaware guy. He understands the working man. 
That's why I like him. He understands what's really going on. He used he to go by, by train to from companies Washington companies to, yes, he does. <laughs> but he knows, he knows what he's doing. Now, See, at 81, right. I want to tell you something. Okay. We can get on Biden all we want. He's old. He stutters. Let me tell you something. Try, five, try 10 meetings a day. Intense meetings. Mm. Try going through this, the National Security Review every morning. Try doing that and staying up. Try doing that and staying alert. It's an incredible job. Thank God for his wife. Thank God for his wife. It's like doing a show with you. <laughs> he's, <laughs> a, he's a remarkable <laughs> man. But yeah. I'm saying, All right. so when they say, um, I don't want him to run again, if there's no one else, and he's I'm sorry that Cuomo was taken out, I really am, you can get on him for his alleged uh, picadillos, but I think Cuomo had the cojones, the hoots, the but to tell Trump to his face, I wish you would try some of that stuff. And you know you who need, would you do better? That? You know what would do better and had none of that who? garbage? Bernie. We are don't right. you let, let me gotta, let me explain something to you. <laughs> okay, you do you understand go ahead. I'm how anti Semitic this nation is? Anti Semitic whose station? This nation is. Oh. Okay. Do you understand we've never had a Jewish president? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I know, I know. Almost happened. Do you understand that Hillary Clinton and her yeah. minions did their best to sabotage uh, Bernie Sanders? Well, He's listen. a great guy. Yeah. Great guy. It reminds me of all of the intellectuals from Brooklyn College that I remember. You but know, he was not, I'm sorry, she took him out. The for, Democrats for that had, reason? The, because yes, she's afraid not, that they lose? Afraid of the uh, radicalism. She was back. You know, Bernie by could a, take care of himself on all that. She was, she was backed by Put a coterie. Put him up there, he would hold She his was own. backed by a coterie of millionaires and multimillionaires. The, the Republicans and the Democrats are feeding from the same trough. She wanted that money. And Bernie was, go, was reducing the ability, uh, mm -hmm. or forestalling the ability for them to make that money. Now, here's the deal. Obama, the same thing. Obama knew these kids from Harvard. I mean, they were giving him $22 million a day. Don't you think that had an effect well, on his policies? Of course it did. Course. It's stupid for us See, to think. Oba uh, uh, Cornel West said that. Yeah. Now, I, I happen to think um, that she was the wrong candidate for the time. Uh, they couldn't pick anyone else, so they wanted her. I think she would have made a great president, but I think um, it was too much. Uh, too well, soon, too much too soon. In now, terms of what transformation, transformative ideas would she have? What have the neoliberals contributed? Well, she was always smarter than Bill. She was always smarter yeah, than Bill. Smart is, not, as, as you know from what Cornell would say, yeah. it's not about smartness. No, it's not. It's about it's adroitness. About, yeah, adroitness. Th there's a certain integrity and, and soulfulness well, that she doesn't have. I have this, and here's but, the conspiracy thing. Okay. I believe that she was smarter than Bill, and I believe <laughs> that they got, yeah. that they found, she was the one who first floated the idea of a two-state solution in Israel. And when they saw that, and they saw him mimicking, parroting that, they decided to bust him with this woman. Um, I don't believe. Wow. Uh, that's well. Uh, there, right. there are a lot of people who have, are anti-Semitic. They say the the editor was Jewish. Uh, the girl was. Uh, they do a whole thing on uh, so, Bill Clinton. So Bill Clinton's was, 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 was uh, who was Jewish. Yeah. So they wait a minute. Who who is behind this conspiracy? I've heard the it Jews? on the streets. I've heard it on the streets. But you get this all the time. No, but who was behind that? It's uh, the they Jewish say power brokers. No. Who didn't want the two-state solution? They say Israel was behind it. Well, the Mossad. <laughs> we go. Well, there's, a, there's again, you know what? That's, Jim, I'm not saying, Jim, look, Jim, the right Mossad, wing, the left wing, they Mossad, all sort Mossad of, is, there's this mysterious cabal. Mossad is no joke. And if yeah, I were in a country that was besieged by everyone, a hundred Arabs to one Jew, I'd have a little bit of a, 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 bes a siege mentality too. Unfortunately for Israel, they don't know how powerful they are. They don't know how much we love them. They don't, un they, they don't understand that I, for example, a black Puerto Rican, Pentecostal, raised by my mother, cannot hate Israel. I was raised with that right. folklore. I, I was raised with right. David uh, and Goliath and Samson all and the, yeah. Joshua and Samuel, all of them, uh, James and Peter and Paul, who was a nut, all of them, I, right. I was raised with them. How can I be against Israel? Now, my particular, uh, uh, Avocation is reading about Israel and studying uh, Judaica. I love that stuff. Same here. Uh, yeah. Friends of mine said, what's wrong with you? Are you Jewish? But I was raised by, I was educated by Ashkenazi Jews. How can I ever? But then you would also realize, too, that we, you're dealing with a traumatized population as well as the Palestinians. So two traumatized populations. Hurt people hurt people, which is exactly. why they're treating the Palestinians the same way yeah. that the Boer South Africans treated 
are blacks. They don't want to. Jimmy Carter wrote a book about this, and he said it's, we, it's an apartheid system. They hated his guts. They Felipe, don't want him there Felipe, anymore. We've done about 16 different shows here. This has been terrific. What I want to do in the in the remaining five minutes that we have is. I mean, an hour has passed already. It just. No, you're, you're you're kidding me. It's gone. Well, we got five more minutes. Okay. But but because we're going to have you on again, we're going to do other shows and stuff. So I want you brought. I bought several here. books. Look, please the first, tell us about the, this. Is Cornell West? Uh, it's called right. a Pro Black Prophetic Fire. You must get this book. He uh, discusses. It's a conversation between he and a um, and a journalist from Europe. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Cornell West. Now this is about King, correct? It's about everybody. It's about Malcolm the, King the, the and, great and 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 his views on militarism leaders. and racism in this country. Okay. The next book is a thing called. A short account of the destruction of the Indies. If you think that the Spanish were nice guys, mm. and this is for you, Puerto Rican, this is for mm. you, Dominican, this is for you, Cuban, this mm. is for you, Argentina. If you think that Spain was a benevolent nation, read this. Mm. The way they tortured uh, Native Americans, the way they went into places and they just, they would use steel swords to cut a man in half yeah, just yeah. To, for fun. Yeah. They had dogs that loved human flesh. It's called uh, uh, A Short Account of the Destruction of the Indies by Patalomé de las Casas. The Inquisition. A and he so. was the one who said, the Indians are being killed. Do me a favor, let's go to Africa and get the blacks. Yeah. Uh, he recanted after a while, but it was too late. Another book that I think you should read, and I should, I should teach, shouldn't I? Yeah, is, absolutely, well, we are. Is Africans is in America. That's your This here. book is incredible. You've got to read this. It, uh, it's written by Charles Johnson and Patricia Smith. Please pick up this book. And then the last book I want you to see, I want you to think about at least, is War Against All Puerto Ricans by Nelson Does, a dear friend of mine. War mm. Against All Puerto Ricans. You want to know why, um, three minutes, you want to know why we are the way we are? You want to understand what they did to Puerto Rico? My grandmother, mm, I'm going to get emotional. Yeah. Um, Margo, my, right? My grandmother was in the Massacre de Ponce. She was there. My uncle was uh, Pedro Apiso Campos' bodyguard. We have a history of revolution. We should not forget it. I want the independence of Puerto Rico. I cannot go beyond my people. I can only do what they allow me to do. And so if we, and by the way, m new seedlings are growing up. They're building their own farms. They're uh, beginning to uh, muscle. Uh, a guy in Arjuntas, Puerto Rico, has a, his, own, his little town, mm. um, Casa Pueblo, is doing great things with electricity, great things um, with radio stations, he's doing his, his best. Bill Maso, I think his name is Bill Maso. Connect him to the guy in Iowa. That's what we need, a world that's he told me, together. He told me, like look, that. <laughs> I do not like the fact that I have diminishing returns on my crops. He said, what hurts me, and he said, and forgive me, it's not because black or, but a lot of inner city kids don't want to work. I said, they've been de-incentivized. I said, I would work. He said, but you got to get up before in the morning. I said, I don't sleep anyway. There's no problem. Mm -hmm. Um, he said, well, you're one of the few. He said, but it's not only you. White kids don't want to get up and work on the farms. So we've lost. It's been mechanized to the point of extinction. A lot of us don't understand how mm -hmm. important land is. Mm -hmm. um, I love going to the, to the Midwest. I have friends in Chicago. I have friends in um, Arizona. Um, we don't understand that people are people. Wherever I go, I meet somebody who I love. And this guy said, you know something? You really interested in farming? I said, I told you I am. Hmm. He shook my hand. His hand was like, yeah. I it was like a steel vice. Yeah. These old guys, yeah. boy, when they grab your hand, you Gnarled don't want to mess with them. No, 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 strong. Strong, yeah. And he gave me his number. He said, when you come back to Iowa, you look me up. I said, you won't get uh, problems with your neighbors? He said, I wish the hell they would. Yeah. Do you understand? He loved yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, he didn't love the culture. That's all right, because we can eventually get him to understand what black is in America. Yeah. Wow. Well, that, that's a, I think that's a, a really good way of, of sort of wrapping up this show here. Um, I, I thought, it was, I th well, I we thought it was half an hour. No, uh, no, we're, no. An we hour we were doing this? Well, listen, if you didn't have another meeting, we'd go on for hours. <laughs> but, it. you know, we, you're coming. We're going to do, gonna do it again. again. We, there's plenty of things to talk about. Folks, I folks. Love you very much. Appreciate you, too, you so very much. Folks. Yes. Let me tell you something. Tell me something in 30 seconds. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Keep the faith. Keep going. Believe in God and believe in revolution. That's it. There we go. I agree. All right. Take care. 
Felipe, I look forward to our next show and seeing you very soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you so very, thank very Thank you, much. Jim. Appreciate and thank it. you all for watching us here on The Radical Imagination. This is Jim Vredos. We'll see you again next week on The Radical Imagination. Mood Mosque layers the trunk of my spirit today, a clumping together of things not said or done yesterday. And yet while I lie still in this old growth forest, I smile at the warmth of your loving sunlight, marvel at the slinky way you sneak through these memory trees and thick branches of obstruction to lather me with layers of warm wind and whispers, a blanket of pretty yellow bubbles to protect the bark of promise that grows despite my indolence. I may lie still and make no sound, but I know what you're doing, and I love the massage. For me, today is simply today, but I know what it means to you. It is the day you were born, the day you live for. And while I feel weak and wounded and covered with pieces of dreams not finished, I rise early to stretch and roar to all the beings in my verdant world that you, that lovely little squirrel, are my love and that you and only you can scamper up and down my trunk any time you want. And I will protect you from firestorms and foxes, boogly bears and wily wolves. They may laugh at us, my size, your tininess, but they know that we love each other tenderly. And so while I lumber through this forest in my grumpy vapors and while you jump through the underbrush looking for God knows what, I revel in the fresh breath of this morning, this day, and shout and shrouding you in my strong leafy arms, Happy Valentine's Day, little big girl, because every day is a love day with you, and I love that we love your day today.